work with Alex McCollum on uh, hyperfine interactions in that material that I have no clue on how you say that properly. Instead of just saying prosodymium, osmium, antimonium, there must be a name for this. That's Order. its name. It's Prasodymium Osmium Antimony, so it doesn't have a special name. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for being here. Um, I want to start, like everyone else, by thanking the organizers. I'm really enjoying this workshop. I, I'm learning a lot. I'm especially enjoying the mixture of talks and topics, so you've done a great job. Thanks very much. And, of course, thanks also for the invitation and the opportunity to present my work or some of, some of our work here. So I'm going to talk to you um, about something slightly different. I'll talk about experimental results. Can everybody hear me okay? Is this uh, fine? Yeah, okay, good. Um, so I'm Alex McCollum, and I, I work at the High Field Magnet Laboratory in Nijmegen in the Netherlands. Um, most of this work was done uh, by my student, Femke, uh, but also by me. In fact, I really did some work in the lab for this experiment. Um, the, the experiments that I'll tell you about were mostly done uh, in London at the University of uh, London Royal Holloway uh, with support from John Saunders and his group and the European Microkelvin platform. Um, and what I'm going to do is take you down in temperature today and say that this is uh, also a new horizon that we need to, to explore because when we go very low in temperature, we see new effects and new type of physics that can come out from the interaction of the nuclear degrees of freedom with the electronic phases. And I hope that I can convince you that you can find useful information and also interesting physics there. Um, the samples of this material were single crystals grown by Bodan Andraka at the University of Florida. So I said I work at the High Field Lab, and this is just an advertisement for our laboratory. So this is on a nice winter morning in the Netherlands. Um, the high field part of the laboratory is on this side, and this is a free electron laser uh, laboratory. And it's a user facility. It's an international user facility. So if any of you ever want to do uh, measurements in high magnetic fields, you can apply for time and, and come to use our uh, high field magnets. We have up to 38 Tesla at the moment. Um, and they work very well, so you can think about it. You can also do it in com uh, combination with far infrared spectroscopy with the free electron laser. So this is, this is uh, how we look and where we are, and now I will tell you about this material. So this material was discovered uh, quite a long time ago. At least it's been known for a while, but the, the phase diagram was investigated and, and superconductivity was discovered in 2002, which is what brought some attention to it. So the crystal structure is here. It's a, a filled scutterdite structure, so the presidymium atoms sit on the corners of this cubic structure. It's slightly distorted from cubic, so these uh, cages here of the antimony atoms are, are slightly distorted, which gives it a tetrahedral rather than a pure cubic symmetry. Um, and this gives you a little bit of anisotropy in the phase diagram. This is uh, temperature as a function of magnetic field. You can predict, perhaps, that magnetic field will be involved. But superconductivity is quite robust, 1.85 Kelvin and 2.2 Tesla for the critical uh, temperature and field. And then at high magnetic field, there's a region of antiferroquadrupolar order. So this is not magnetic order, but quadrupole or multipole order. Um, there's very weak magnetism in this system, which allows the, the multipole order to be dominant. Um, so it was interesting for both of these reasons, um, particularly the, the superconductivity, as this was the first presidymium-based heavy fermion system um, to be showing superconductivity or at least unconventional superconductivity. Um, as I said, uh, if we're talking about new horizons, it's not a new material. It's already uh, rather old. But the physics that I'm going to talk about is what's happening down here at very low temperatures, so down to one millikelvin, which was the lowest that we could go. Um, and we see, I think, some rather interesting uh, physics in this region. So first, just to give you a taste or a, a bit of background on the superconductivity, um, if we look at the, the sister compound, the lanthanum osmium antimony, so there are no F electrons in the lanthanum compound, um, and the presidymium has 4F2 configuration of electrons. This one is also a superconductor, but it's a simple S-wave VCS superconductor. It has a transition temperature of 740 millikelvin and a very low uh, critical field, upper critical field. This one has, as I said, 1.85 Kelvin and a 2.2 Tesla um, HC2. So it's much more robust superconductivity, and this has to be because of the F electrons. So the idea, the, the crystal structures are very similar, and the phonons are very similar in these two materials. So it's expected that this one also has a, an electron-phonon pairing channel, but that there's another pairing channel on top associated with the F electrons that is making this much more robust superconductivity. I'm also showing you here the heat capacity as a function of temperature. So this is going 
uh, specific heat into the superconducting phase, and delta C over T, so the uh, Sommerfeld coefficient extrapolated there is about 500 millijoules per mole Kelvin squared. So it's really heavy fermion. Is there a structural transition? No. The, this, there's this distortion, the structure is important, and um, so the fact that it's tetragonal rather than cubic is important uh, because it decides which quadrupoles can form or, or what the multipoles are, but there isn't an actual structural transition. This one? Oh, yeah, sorry. These are just measurements of heat capacity, so these are showing uh, excitations between crystal phi levels. I'll, I'll, I'll get to this in a moment. Sorry, I should have, I meant to cover them up on the phase diagram there. I didn't get around to it. Um, okay, so this is just to show you that the uh, quasi-particles that condense into the superconducting state are heavy. Again, evidence that the F-electrons are, that there's some conduction electron F-electron coupling involved um, in the, the normal state and in the superconductivity. Yes? Why the specific field turns off uh, in low There's a, sh uh, this is, going, you mean here, like yeah. this? So this is going into the superconducting phase. There's a shock anomaly as well. Um, okay. Yeah. So I, I really am showing this just to show you the number. Um, if you, yeah. So there's a, there's a large nuclear moment and there's a shock anomaly which okay. isn't subtracted yet in this, uh, yeah. Okay, so phonons are similar. F electrons do something to enhance the superconductivity, but it's not known what the mechanism of superconductivity is even still um, and what the F electrons do. So this is uh, something that I will come back to. And then also this um, multipole phase. So the, the important physics uh, for this part of the phase diagram is the crystal field physics. Um, so praseodymium has a J equal to 4 multiplet. This is the crystal field splitting then. Um, and we have a gamma 1 non-magnetic singlet ground state and a gamma 4 triplet first excited state. These are close together. Um, the higher levels are much further away, 65, even a bit more Kelvin. So we can treat this as a kind of a two-level system. When you put this in magnetic field, the magnetic field mixes, first of all, the gamma 1 and gamma 4 levels. Um, and also the Zeeman splitting of the triplet here causes a level crossing at this point. And this is what's allowing us to have the quadrupoles um, forming and ordering. So when you increase the field and these levels move closer together, you can't have a quadrupole and a singlet. You need a doublet for that. But in this region, you get a kind of a quasi-doublet forming. Um, and then you can form a quadrupole. And then the quadrupoles can order. So this is schematic. The levels don't actually cross. I'll show you something a bit more realistic in a moment. Um, and then, OK, the excitation between these two levels. Now the ground state is the triplet level and the excitation. This is what these uh, points were up here. So I, yeah, as I said, I meant to take them off. I forgot. There is some anisotropy, but we see the same physics along all crystal directions, just with shifted phase boundaries. So there's, there's not really a difference in physics, just a difference in the, in the phase boundaries. OK, a more realistic crystal field level scheme. So this we did just with mean field um, theory. So there's the crystal field term in the Hamiltonian, and now there's a quadrupole term in the Hamiltonian that gives you the anti-crossing, the interactions here, and the anti-crossing. Um, and what we understand is that outside of this antifero quadrupolar region, we've just got a usual Boltzmann-type excitation between the crystal field levels. And then once you get inside this region, or once you get close enough, um, you actually have a superposition of these two states rather than an excitation from, from one to the other. And that's what allows us to have the quadrupole ordering in this case. These are just representations of the charge density on the F electrons. This one has no magnetic moment, so it's flat, and this one has some magnetic moment. This is the triplet. OK, so why do we want to measure to, to low temperature? This phase diagram was mapped out already quite some time ago, but we were looking at quantum oscillations on the Fermi surface to see if we could understand, well, a little bit if there's some quantum criticality or some effects of quantum criticality associated here, and also if there was any change in the Fermi surface across this uh, level crossing. This work was done a long time ago, and, and the story I just want to tell you is that if, if we think about the magnetization, um, the oscillatory part of the magnetization for the de Haas van Alphen effect is 2 pi times this is just a harmonic number. This is the frequency of the quantum oscillation. So here you've got this is magnetic susceptibility versus magnetic field, and these are very nice de Haas van Alphen oscillations that we could see. Um, but there's also a phase of the, of the quantum oscillations, and this is a quite a neglected quantity. Um, but the phase is also proportional to the cross-sectional area of the Fermi surface, and just to cut the story a little bit short, 
the change in the phase um, as a function of field or temperature is proportional to the change in the Fermi surface cross-sectional area as, as a function of field or temperature. So if the phase increases, the Fermi surface is growing, and if the phase decreases, the Fermi surface is shrinking. So that's basically what we're looking at. And what we saw in this earlier work was, if you look at, this is the axis that you care about and the green triangle. So this is phase as a function of temperature. If we start here at high temperature, we see that the phase is increasing. Um, then it hits a maximum, which is at this temperature, which it's 6.2 Tesla, so it's around about here. So this maximum corresponds to the phase boundary here. And then the phase decreases inside of this phase. And then we noticed at 250 millikelvin or so, this was the unusual part, that it really, the temperature dependence became much steeper and much more pronounced. So this is not at all what you would expect. You would expect that this should just saturate uh, here. You could imagine, um, so, so this, uh, this change is probably just related to the temperature dependence of the exchange splitting of the Fermi surface as you mix this singlet and magnetic triplet levels. You're mixing a magnetic state into the ground state. So you're increasing the magnetization and you're increasing the exchange splitting of the Fermi surface. Um, but this should saturate. So we didn't really know why it suddenly got more temperature dependent, that this was enhanced. Um, so this, we, we, even at this stage, we looked into this, and then we thought, okay, we're, we're neglecting to think about hyperfine interactions and the, the nuclear degrees of freedom. So we put this into our Hamiltonian. So this is just a hyperfine term that we added to the mean, fin, mean field Hamiltonian. And our level scheme then looked like this. These are the triplet and singlet levels. Magnetic field will split them and mix them. Uh, here's the quadrupole phase, and the hyperfine interaction just uh, splits this, uh, these crystal field levels into a, a manifold of six hyperfine states. But what it does is it enhances the mixing between the two, and it sort of preferentially mixes the gamma four, which is this magnetic one, into the ground state. So of the hyperfine states, the lowest hyperfine state has more of the magnetic uh, state, so it has a higher moment than the, the highest uh, hyperfine state here. So, the hyperfine interaction mixes, increases the mixing between these two levels and mixes more of the magnetic state uh, in as you go lower in temperature. So this, uh, we put it into the in mean field model, and I, I see now from this picture that it's a bit dark for you to see, but there's a black line uh, which gives the phase boundary um, without the hyperfine interactions included. It's also over here. The red line is the regular mean field phase boundary. Um, and the purple line here, same as the black line over here, is when we include the hyperfine term. So basically, this says at very low temperature, the hyperfine interaction should stabilize the antiferroquadrupole order at lower field, um, and it should sort of destabilize it at higher field here. We had data at that time up to a, or down to about 100 millikelvin. Um, we could see that this one was matching quite well. We could see this kind of undercutting of the phase boundary at high field. Um, but this one already looked a bit different. So if we match the high temperature data points, we could already see that this phase boundary was deviating from the mean field phase boundary. Um, so we wanted to explore a little bit and go to lower temperature to see if we could, well, one, if, if our prediction of, of hyperfine modification of this phase boundary was true, um, but also what else happens down here. Um, oh, yeah, another way of thinking of this uh, effect of the hyperfine interaction is that this is just now a zoom of this area on the crystal field level scheme. It reduces the gap between the two levels, right? So we're mixing these two levels together, and by splitting these, you're effectively reducing the gap between uh, this upper one and this lower one. So that's just another way of thinking about it. The quadrupoles form when the levels are closer together. Um, by splitting the, the states here, you're actually reducing this gap so that the quadrupole and the order can form at slightly lower field. So that's, uh, that's kind of what we're seeing, that this just shifts to lower field here. Okay, so we wanted to measure lower temperature. Um, we can measure down to about 50 millikelvin in our high magnetic fields, but not any colder than that. It's a, it's a bit difficult to do, so we had to go to some specialists. Um, and this is the, the nuclear demagnetization refrigerator at Royal Holloway. Um, and we wanted to measure magnetic susceptibility, which was a challenging thing to measure, but it's very sensitive. Uh, we wanted also to be able to measure the quantum oscillation still so that we could compare everything that we had seen above uh, with what we would now measure below. So this took us a long time to set up, but eventually uh, it worked. So what we've got is a, a copper demagnetization stage here. 
Um, and this is the demagnetization uh, magnet, which will allow this one to, to get very cold. A few hundred microkelvin, or even a, a few microkelvin. But with our measurement on there, there's a lot of extra heat. So our base temperature was about one millikelvin. The field modulation technique is basically, yeah, this is the, yeah, we put the sample in a pair of pickup coils. So these two coils are counterwound. Um, the sample sits in one of them, and then the windings on the, the counterwound coil cancel the background. Um, and we also have a modulation coil that goes around the outside. So these two little coils are sitting inside this one. Um, this is just from Faraday's law or the flux law. So the EMF reduced across the pickup coils is proportional to the rate of change of magnetic flux, which we provide with the modulation field. So that's the field modulation technique. Um, and that's proportional to the magnetic susceptibility, which we can then detect. All of this is sitting down here inside the, the sample magnet, which can go up to Actually, it can go up to nine Tesla, but we didn't measure above uh, seven Tesla during these measurements. Mostly, we stayed between two Tesla and five Tesla, so six Tesla. Um, OK, so this is my only slide about the experiment, but it took us a very long time to get this right. We had a couple of attempts. Our first attempt, we couldn't cool below one uh, uh, 30 millikelvin or so. Um, but in the end, we got there. But just for the experimentalists, I want to, you can imagine with this type of measurement that there's a lot of heating. Um, and we had to get all the heat out. So there's dual heating from all of the wires and all kinds of things. There are eddy currents because of the modulation field in the coils and in the sample and in everything else that's around there. And also surprisingly, we had a lot of vortex heating from flux motion in the superconducting coil. So we had to identify all of these sources of heating and get that heat out. So we had to make a very detailed thermal model of this bottom part of the fridge. We made thermal breaks and thermal links, and then we had to test and characterize. And eventually, we, as I said, we got it right. But um, OK, it was two years of work to actually make these measurements work. Um, OK, so what we see, this is the real part of the magnetic susceptibility as a function of magnetic field. And you can see that the superconducting transition is, is very prominent. Um, and it's in the right place, and everything is OK. This is at 7 uh, millikelvin or so. Um, it looks like nothing else happens in this curve, but if you zoom in on this sort of flat-looking part up here, then you can see that the antiferroquadrupolar phase boundary is also very pronounced. So this is, is up here, and you can see not only that there's a very uh, sharp and, and prominent transition into the antiferroquadrupole phase, but you can see, I hope, that the quantum oscillations are there on top of this. Um, and the quantum oscillations continue all the way through the phase transition. So the, br uh, the width of the phase transition is not smearing or inhomogeneity in the material. It's an intrinsic width of this transition. So if it were smearing or, or some kind of inhomogeneity, then the quantum oscillations would also be damped across the transition. You wouldn't see them. The fact that they don't change all the way through tells us that it's an intrinsic uh, width. All right, so what we did is we measured across this transition. We wanted to see what happened to the phase boundary. Um, we've got the magnetic field parallel to the 1, 1, yeah, I think I, I said that here, 1, 1, 0 uh, axis of the, or direction of the crystal. We did this at multiple temperatures, so this is 300 millikelvin, 100 millikelvin, 1 millikelvin, just to illustrate how the phase boundary is shifting with temperature, even down to, to the lower temperatures. Again, the, the quantum oscillations are very nice there on top. But in fact, for what I am talking about now, we didn't want the quantum oscillations, so we took them away. We modeled them, fitted them, and just subtracted them because we wanted to accurately measure the phase boundary and the modulation from the quantum oscillations on top could interfere with this, so we took them out. Um, and then we differentiated these curves and took the peak of the derivative, so we're actually taking the steepest point of this um, transition as our um, transition point. So if we take the foot of this jump or the, or the top, we get the same shape of phase boundary. It just shifts, obviously, a little bit. Uh, so where we choose to take the transition doesn't change the shape of the phase boundary, only it just shifts it a little bit in field. So we stick to the steepest point because we think that this is probably uh, the right place. So here I show you temperature versus the, the phase boundary, the, the, the field value at which we take the transition. And if we start at 400 millikelvin and come down, you can see that this is really evolving um, quite a lot as a function of temperature. And then below 100, 150 millikelvin, it takes off and it, it goes even more rapidly. Um, this is the, the inset is this lowest temperature part here. 
Um, and you can see that it saturates uh, at the lowest temperature. So these lowest points are 7 millikelvin, 5 millikelvin, 3 millikelvin, 1 millikelvin. So there's still a difference between 7 and 5, uh, but below 5, it saturates. Okay, so how does this compare to our predictions, and, and how can we understand what's, uh, what's going on there? So to remind you what we were doing with our, our calculations, so we have the mean field Hamiltonian with a crystal field term, the Zeeman term, and the quadrupole term, and that's the yellow line uh, in this plot. So it just should saturate at low temperature. When you add the hyperfine term, you get the blue line, um, and that gave us this sort of shift of the, the phase boundary and, and a saturation actually also at low, uh, at low temperature and at lower magnetic field. So these are our data points that I showed you also on the previous slide. And quantitatively, the match is not good, but qualitatively, the shape of this phase boundary is really very well matched to what we would predict by including just the hyperfine interactions in the, in the mean field Hamiltonian. Um, also, this saturation below 5 millikelvin comes out of the, the theory as well. So this is really a, I think, well, we thought that this was a great match. We were very pleased uh, with it. The other thing to think about is that at this low temperature, now inside this phase, the, the physics down here or the, the, the system down here is really quite different to, to up here. So now you have nuclear and electronic states entangled. This is not something exotic. This is the hyperfine interaction. It's not, it's not something that I'm proposing as a, some kind of drama at low temperature. Um, but it means that you have a different phase. Uh, you have different low energy excitations. Um, the characterization of this phase at lower temperature is going to be very different to higher temperature. Um, and you have some kind of change from, from low to high temperature. Um, different quasi-particles uh, down here to, to up here. And also, there's a, a new type of quantum critical point associated with that. So this is a second order phase transition. And this is now an exposed quantum critical point, which is also something quite unusual. Because often with quantum criticality, you have a new phase emerging in the region of the, the quantum critical point, which, which masks it, which avoids it. Um, superconductivity is a common one. But here we have a, an exposed quantum critical point. So this is also a really nice opportunity to, to study what happens uh, in this region. So it's nuclear electronic sort of hybrid order in this region and then disorder out here. Uh, yeah, so this is what I was saying about the, the quantum critical point, And this is uh, kind of something that we're uh, interested to look into a little bit more. There's no uh, theory about what would happen in such a case of a hybrid nuclear electronic order in a quadrupole or multipole system. But there was some recent work by Heike Eisenlohr and Matthias Voita where they looked at the effect of nuclear spins on magnetic quantum criticality. So this was quite recently. Um, so this is a totally different case. This is ferromagnetic order. But their proposal was that as you involve the nuclear degrees of freedom at low temperature, you kind of cancel out the electronic quantum criticality. So you would still perhaps have some signatures of electronic quantum criticality at high temperature, but this would be cut off below some temperature. The original sort of purely electronic quantum critical point would be here, and the nuclear spins or the nuclear degrees of freedom would shift the, the quantum critical point, and you will have a nuclear quantum criticality um, with different characteristics here. Now, it's not what we've got here, right? This is not magnetic. The, the nuclear spins are interacting differently with the quadrupoles compared to the way they would with a, a ferromagnetic system. Um, and also, you can see the shape of our phase boundary is, is not the shape of this phase boundary. But it's interesting maybe to explore more what's going on there. Um, to think about the excitations and, and the characterization of, of both this phase and of this quantum critical point, we looked at the temperature dependence of the susceptibility. Um, at two and a half tesla, so what we're doing here is at fixed field, we're sweeping the temperature. Um, so at, at various magnetic fields, we're just sweeping the temperature in this direction. Two and a half tesla is far outside this phase, somewhere over here, and it's kind of flat. You know, it looks Curie Weiss like, fairly normal, that's okay. Um, as we come closer to the, the transition and the phase boundary here, we start to see an upturn in the susceptibility. At the, the phase transition, this isn't exactly on it, but it's close. We see a, a sharp or a steep upturn in the susceptibility at low temperature. Um, and then when we're deeper inside, so 5 tesla is, is over here, deep inside the AFQ phase, then we see a kind of a hysteretic or, or memory type effect when we sweep the temperature up and then down again um, that we also don't really understand. But the, the temperature scale is the same scale as the nuclear, as, as the hyperfine interactions. So 
you would expect near, a, say, an antiferromagnetic quantum critical point or even an antiferroquadrupole quantum critical point, some kind of critical scaling uh, associated with that, typically a power law, a single power law. We can't get a single power law out of this behavior, so it's changing a lot as a function of temperature. Um, so it's possible that we do have a couple of different temperature scales or energy scales that we need to look at, so we're still busy trying to understand how to characterize this, but we think that it's a... It's interesting physics, at least. Um, we can, from all of these field sweeps, we can get the temperature dependence at, at whatever field we like, really. Um, and if we go exactly to this 4.27 Tesla, where the critical point should be, the shape of the curve is, is very similar to the shape of this curve. So it's not like there's some dramatic divergence there. So that would suggest that uh, um, the ordering wave vector is at some finite Q and not at Q equal to zero. All right. So what about the superconductivity? Um, this is what happens to the antiferroquadrupole phase. But this plot that I'm showing you, I think I forgot to mention earlier what the color was. But the, the color here is the occupancy of the hyperfine ground state. So if, the, if everything is in the ground state, it's dark blue. Um, and when the hyperfine ground state, when everything is excited, it's yellow. So up here, uh, nothing is in the ground state, and down here, everything is in the ground state. So this color sort of tells you where you can expect the influence of the hyperfine interactions. Um, and you know, this is sort of what we see. We see this variation down here where it's starting to get a bit blue. So this is still relevant for the superconductivity. So then, thank you. What do we see uh, in that region? So I expected that this superconductivity would come to meet the antiferroquadrupole phase that we would, well, okay, did I expect it? I hoped, perhaps, that that's what would happen. But it didn't happen. It did the opposite of what I wanted, of course. Um, so this is the data, or these are the data. Um, the superconductivity is suppressed, but uh, this is the imaginary part of the superconductivity as a function of field and the real part. And you can see that 400 millikelvin, it, uh, these are all at different temperatures, between 400 and 5 millikelvin. Um, it behaves perfectly normally at high temperature, but then there's a maximum in HC2, and then it curves back under. And the same in the, the real part, and if we plot this, you can see that the superconductivity cuts under at low temperature. This dashed line is what you would expect from HC2 based on the high temperature behavior um, where you don't expect any hyperfine interaction. So there's an extrapolation of what you would expect from high temperature. So why this suppression? The energy scale or the temperature scale here again tells you that the origin is probably similar, that it's to do with the hyperfine interactions. Whoops. Um, and just to remind you what's going on there, the hyperfine term or the hyperfine interaction is mixing this magnetic state into the non-magnetic ground state. So you're effectively adding magnetic impurities into your non-magnetic ground state. So this would enhance exchange scattering in the system, um, and maybe this is what we're seeing. So we, we tried this model from Fulda and Maki, which is quite old by now, but basically it just looks at the effect of, of adding delta M, which is magnetic impurity, into the superconducting state. So there's a this is the black dashed line, which is taken based on the high temperature data where there are no hyperfine interactions. And then the purple one is when we include the hyperfine interaction, giving a delta M that we calculate from, from the hyperfine mixing of the levels. So this is what the delta M looks like based on our mean field calculation. And you can see that the purple line fits extremely well. So this is a really good description of what we see um, in the suppression of the superconductivity. So we think that this nicely explains what's going on. Um, it's not exotic or anything like that. You're simply adding magnetic impurities and you're breaking the Cooper pairs. And yeah, it's quantitatively also, also the saturation is nicely matched and, and everything is, is good here. So apart from being a nice fit to the data, can it really tell us something useful about the superconductivity? And we think that the answer is yes. So in my last one or two minutes, I think I, I should still have. Um, I told you that it's not really understood what the mechanism of superconductivity here is. Um, but from the very beginning, a sort of a favorite candidate was that there are antiferroquadrupole fluctuations that could mediate superconductivity in a similar way to spin fluctuation mediated superconductivity in, a, in an antiferromagnetic quantum critical system or something like that. So this is a common scenario in heavy fermions. You have, say, a nail temperature that's uh, suppressed, and then superconductivity appears near the antiferromagnetic quantum critical point, and the understanding is that the superconductivity is mediated by spin fluctuations. 
the proximity of this superconducting phase and the, the antifera quadrupole phase kind of prompted a similar um, scenario that the antifera quadrupole fluctuations could, in a similar way, enhance the quadrupolar susceptibility to allow um, enough attractive pairing or attractive uh, interaction between electrons in that case. However, what we saw is that the um, antifera quadrupole phase is shifted to lower field. So that should enhance the quadrupole susceptibility at the HC2 or at the superconducting phase boundary. So you would then expect the superconductivity to be enhanced. And this is actually what I expected and, and we didn't see. So the enhancement or the, the stabilization of the AFQ phase at lower field um, would predict enhanced superconductivity, which is not what we see. So this phase is kind of, or this is uh, discounted, I think. Um, the other option or the other sort of strong proposal is that the extra pairing or the enhanced superconductivity is through crystal field excitations. So in this case, it's a quadrupolar exciton. So this is an excitation that develops um, between the, the two crystal field levels. Um, so the quadrupole exciton is basically a, it's a, just a crystal field excitation that's it's dispersive with some finite Q. Um, and there are two possibilities, or there are two scattering mechanisms going on in this case. So one is the exchange scattering, which would be Cooper pair breaking, and we know that that's present in the system and that actually we are, we're enhancing it as we, as we increase the, the field. Um, and then there would be an inelastic charge scattering. So this is also known as just aspherical Coulomb scattering. Um, and this would scatter off the, the quadrupolar exciton, and this would be Cooper pair, Cooper pair forming. Now, these can all, this is usually rather weak, but it can dominate if this is also weak. Um, and in this system, we have no moment in the ground state, so it's non-magnetic. So, and also, the, there's a, a large quadrupole matrix element from, from the crystal field. Uh, so this is kind of a, an ideal scenario to realize this type of pairing. You would also expect this type of superconductivity to be extremely sensitive to in, enhanced exchange scattering, which is what we see, right? So we, may we see our superconductivity is suppressed. We believe that this is because of enhanced exchange scattering. Um, so we think that our results are a strong uh, support for this scenario of quadrupolar exciton mediated superconductivity. We did consider other possibilities. Um, so this is the enhanced exchange scattering scenario that I showed you with the good fit around here. We thought about what would happen with enhanced quadrupole fluctuations, so an enhanced quadrupole susceptibility. This is how the quadrupole susceptibility would look at two Tesla, where the original superconducting transition was. Um, and as I, as I described already in words, because the AFQ phase is shifted to lower field, the quadrupole susceptibility would be enhanced at the sort of superconducting phase boundary. So you would see this enhancement of superconductivity in this scenario, not a suppression. We also considered a modified Pauli limiting or a modified orbital limiting um, because of the, the change in behavior of, of uh, yeah, the system at low temperature. Orbital limiting would enhance the superconductivity very weakly. Pauli limiting would suppress it, um, but so slightly that you don't really see the difference between uh, the original sort of the, the predicted unmodified one. So none of these things uh, can explain the, the strong suppression or relatively strong suppression that we see. So we think that this is really the right explanation. Of course, there may be other scenarios that we haven't considered, but these are the ones that we did consider. Okay, so just to summarize for the superconductivity, um, hyperfine interaction enhances exchange scattering in the superconducting phase, um, and the superconductivity is very sensitive to, I mean, it's a very small effect. This is a tiny magnetization, um, but it's noticeably suppressing the superconductivity here. Um, this supports this uh, mechanism or proposed mechanism of exciton uh, mediated superconductivity. Um, and this would be a pairing channel on top of the electron phonon mediated pairing that we also see in the lanthanum compound, we think. Okay, so to summarize overall, the nuclear degrees of freedom in this system and probably in many other systems um, strongly influence the electronic order um, at low temperatures. So you, know, you, you think that these are sort of strongly correlated electron systems and the physics is all dominated by the electron correlations, but if you go to low enough temperature, which in the case of this material is not actually that low, right? We start to see these effects already below a couple of hundred millikelvin. 
Um, but if you go low enough in temperature, you see a new type of phase, new type of phase transition, um, and also you can get really useful information about the superconductivity that you wouldn't have been able to find out um, in other ways. So thank you for your attention. Well, thank you for the talk and this impressive set of data. So about the Hamiltonian, mm -hmm. can you uh, tell us what, it, what are these variables and how it looks the uh, quadrupole term? Um, yeah, okay, I should have put them there. So the, the Hamiltonian was worked out, uh, did I put the, I didn't put the reference, already by somebody else, by Sheena and uh, Kuzunose and people some time ago. Um, we started by putting the quadrupole terms in by hand, just in the, the matrix, but all of the matrix elements were worked out properly by other people and we copied it. Um, so really we, we took um, these terms as already published and then we just added in this hyperfine term. Okay, and second question, and uh, these are spin a half? Yeah. And uh, do you expect mean field to work for this? It seems to work quite well. Um, so we thought that we would try it and see, but when it good representation of the data, then, yeah, okay, it seems so even. Okay. You would expect maybe to be in high enough, in terms of the quantum critical point, you would expect to be maybe high enough D that you're in a mean field uh, range anyway. But So I think this, this lack of quantitative agreement here between the data and the, the phase boundary at high temperature okay. is a failure of, of the mean field picture because we're not taking everything into account that we should be, um, but we're capturing at least this, this low temperature trend that Thank we're you. trying to do. Yeah. So it would be nice to understand why the whole phase boundary can't be matched, but uh, I think it's not, a, it's not a simple addition to the mean field theory. I think it would need to be done maybe in a different way. Thank you for this very nice talk with the detailed results. Do you expect the results to, to change with pressure? Because I mean, I'm trying to imagine how to change the, the, split, the crystal field splitting. Uh, do you expect them to change or has it been done? We haven't, no, it hasn't been done. Um, to do the measurement to get the pressure cell cold, I think would be too difficult. But uh, pressure does a similar thing to what the low temperature does. So people have measured with pressure at a higher temperature, and this also shifts the AFQ to slightly lower magnetic field. Um, so when I say that, uh, so, so this picture, um, okay, I, I, okay. When this uh, phase boundary is enhanced, and this should enhance the quadrupole susceptibility, and you would expect this to enhance superconductivity, the same scenario is also sort of thrown out the window by the pressure experiments because it moves the um, AFQ phase to, to lower field, but it doesn't enhance the superconductivity in that case either. So a pressure we would expect maybe not to change the temperature dependence, but to shift everything again to lower field. Hi, uh, very nice talk and congratulations for the experiment. That is amazing. And uh, I wanted to ask, uh, at the uh, boundary of the antiferroquadrupolar um, uh, transition, uh, yeah. is there any other signature of quantum criticality in other uh, uh, transport properties? Yeah, um, okay, I predicted this question actually. Um, not, not much is the answer. So this is the A coefficient of the T squared resistivity. Um, and as you go towards this lower field boundary, you see a, a very weak enhancement with a couple of random points that might be higher. So there was some discussion that maybe the, anti, you know, the quantum criticality associated with this antiferroquadrupole phase, and then there's a little bit more over here, but not so much. We measured also with the de Hausmann alphan oscillations, we could measure the effective mass and it doesn't change very much. There's a, there's a very weak enhancement going across the antiferroquadrupole phase, but actually the more dramatic behavior is at high field where the mass takes off. So I would say there isn't a huge signature of quantum criticality in this system, but in a way that fits with our picture because what we think is probably happening is that the nuclear degrees of freedom are suppressing the electronic quantum criticality and, and then you would have a reason for not really seeing very much um, in, the, in the physics. So it was, people were wondering why there wasn't dramatic quantum critical behavior, but this could be an explanation as to why. 
All right, any other questions? So now we are right on time, so let's thank Alex again. Great. And the next speaker will be Valentina Martelli, and I'm reading here on thermal transport.